There is a book and it is called The Happiness Advantage. Uh, it's written by a young man and his name is uh, Sean Acor. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard University. Uh, and he, uh, this is a book that a lot of Fortune 500 companies use to uh, help their staff uh, become uh, joyous and happy. So they are producers. What he did is he took on the notion uh, that success brings happiness and he realized there was a whole lot of unhappy people at, at uh, Harvard uh, that were not happy, that were successful. And so he wrote this book on how it should be the, the other way around, that happiness uh, breeds a successful life. And so if you were to read this book, uh, he's going to list uh, seven concepts to guide you toward uh, happiness. And I'm not going to go through and uh, do a Cliff Notes version of the book for you, but it his seven concepts of what you need to do to find happiness are, are really interesting because uh, they, they run counter to what the scriptures say. But what I found interesting is the introduction to the book. Uh, when you read what he says in the intro, why he wrote this book, uh, it is to dispel that notion uh, that uh, su successful people are happy people, because we know that's probably not always true. Uh, but what he says in the be beginning of the book about, about his time at Harvard University uh, was... Um, that uh, the Harvard Crimson uh, came out at the time, back in 2004, uh, with a study where they polled the students on campus when he was there, uh, and they found out that four out of five Harvard students were completely depressed. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how you felt about your college experience. I was far from depressed. I was having fun. They were depressed, and they're at Harvard. Uh, and so he wrote his book on how to, how to, what happened there. But in the introduction, he says that our, the motto at Harvard used to be, because it used to be a Christian school, uh, the, Harvard, the, the motto used to be uh, the Latin terminology, Veritas Christo, the word for Christ, uh, et ecclesiase, uh, in, translates being truth for Christ and the church. At Harvard, would you say that was applicable now? Probably not. Because he said what they've done at Harvard is they've got, got rid of the, uh, the truth of Christ for the church. They've got rid of that m part of the motto. And now they just hang on veritas, truth. And then they've boiled it down to because they're relativist. Well, there's no absolute overarching truth. There's just truths. And so the students can believe whatever they want to believe. Uh, and that's counted as veritas. Uh, you can kind of see how that would lead to depression. <laughs> because you never know absolutely which is the path versus the wrong path. And so uh, when you read his book, he talks about how uh, they had this great motto, but his book doesn't get back to the essence of the motto, Christ. I mean, he leaves that far behind with this seven secular principles of positive thinking. It's basically what he does. So I have to ask you a question. David is writing about how to, happy, how to have a happy life, how to be joyous. Do you think, and this is a softball question. You ready? Are you ready? I can't hardly see you because of the stage lights. Are you ready? Okay, so do you think David would take issue with this guy? Mm-hmm. Remember David was a warrior? Yeah, he'd take issue with him because what the guy is going to say about positive thinking uh, is, is not the path to true happiness because David's going to teach in Psalm 32 that if you want to have a happy life, the one that knows great joy despite the highs and lows of life, uh, it all starts with a relationship with God. And then it's how you maintain that relationship with God. And so he's going to say, and I'll present to you the principle that we presented last week from this passage, just the main idea. So I'm putting the cookies on the lower shelf to tell you. If you walk out here today and go, what was he talking about today? Well, here, here's the main idea. A, a joyful life is what kind of life? It's a mournful. It's a mournful. Mournful over what? Sin. Sin. See, once I come to a faith relationship in Jesus, and I invite him to be my savior, and he saves me, I have positional holiness as a person. I'm saved. He's forgiven me. But, but I, now I've got to get my practice, my daily practice, to match my lofty position. That's a problem, isn't it? Because you have a free will, and you choose to follow him sometimes, and you choose not to follow him. And so David is talking primarily to Christians, God followers, God fearers, and he's telling them, in your relationship with God, how do you maintain a, a happy life no matter what? So let's review, because it's been a week since we talked about this. The other three principles he already mentioned. Uh, this confessional type life uh, should focus on three things. Number one, joyful living focuses on praise. What kind of praise? Praise that God Almighty in his holiness forgave me of my sin. That first and foremost makes a person uh, happy when they understand what God has done for them. Number two, uh, he says that joyful living focuses on the past. Uh, <laughs> did your parents ever sit you down and say something like this when you're asking them for wisdom and counsel? Or maybe, maybe you didn't even ask them, but that your dad says something like this. Well, when I was your age, you ever hear this? 
I think it's in the Bible somewhere, in the Torah, uh, when I was your age. And then what's coming after that? Instruction on don't do what I did, which was, you know, lame. Do, do this over here. Most students that are younger are looking at their parent going, hey, man, you just don't understand our age. You know, you're out of touch, dad, etc. cetera. But, but David's going to say, hey, if you want to get into happy, ho- joyous living, remember the past that when you sinned and you didn't confess, it didn't go well for you. Remember I told you about stealing the math book and I can't do fractions now and all that stuff and I confessed? Were you here last week? Yeah, kind of shocking, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, you've done your own sin, right? You stole the science book or something. Uh, yeah, but, but if you remember the past, I didn't confess and I was miserable, but when I did confess, it was joyous. So point three is, uh, joyful is, li- living focuses on the provision, which is the forgiveness of God. So that when you didn't confess and you struggled in your inner being with, does something matter with my life? I think it's got to do with my sin. I feel terrible. But you don't confess it. You're, it's like your bones ache, he says. But when you do come to God and say, God, I have sinned, he looks down from heaven and says, well, it's about time. Let me forgive you, son, and restore you. Now, to that, David is going to add a couple more concepts. Uh, verses 6 and 7 and verse 10 all go together. Here he's going to say, joyful living also focuses on the protection. The protection from who is the question. Notice what he says. For this cause, which is a a, a Hebrew statement, it's emphatically placed in the sentence to explain to you the result of what he just said. So the result of having a confessional life uh, should cause you to think about the protection of God. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you, God, in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near unto him, the person in question. For this cause, this, based on this forgiveness, God, you give, uh, somebody who's godly should pray to you when you can be found. This is, this is very interesting, because the implication is here is somebody who's not godly. Remember, who's he talking to contextually? Christians or non-Christians? What say you? Hmm? He's talking to believers. So he's saying, believers that are godly, when they see the sin they've committed and they confess it, uh, they've come to God uh, when he may be found. Which means, if I'm a Christian and I'm getting engaged in sin willfully and I choose not to repent of it, then God may not be found. Now, I know you can say theologically, God is omnipresent. That's impossible. Well, he's not talking about that. He's talking about relationally. Your sin impacts the intimacy you have with the Father. So he says, if God is convicting you of a sin you're committing and you're not confessing it. It may get to the point where you may not find God. Like, like when you pray and you say, well, God doesn't answer my prayers. But, but if you're sinning, he's going to pull back from you. I mean, think about when you were a child and you, with your parents. If you willfully told your parents where to get off, how'd that go for you? Not well. Trust me, I did all these things. Uh, and you just told him, no way, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. And, and so he said, well, just like a parent would pull back, God will pull back uh, for what reasons? I'll give you two reasons why God would pull back when you sin and you don't confess. Number one, he's absolutely holy. If you absolutely prove, p- pursue that which is profane, don't expect for him to sit by and say, hey, I'm going to have a, a total part of that. No, he's not. So he may pull back in that sense. Number two, uh, he will get, uh, get your attention like a father would. He may, if your father was ever silent after you did something, it's kind of ominous, is it not? Now, when my father came home at night, he came home when I was younger as a, as a U.S. Customs officer with a gun belt and the whole shebang. So when my mother, mother met him at the door and said, we need to talk about Marty, this was not good. This is not good. He's taken off the gun belt and everything. I'm thinking, whew, okay, you know. Uh, but but if he ever just said, uh, I, I, I gotta I gotta I gotta think for a few minutes and backed off from me, it's like, oh no, now what's gonna happen? So it's that silence of God. God might be silence uh, in your life because He wants you to think about what you're doing because He wants you to be godly and confess so you can have happiness. Uh, look at or in the New Testament to see uh, what Paul says about the silence of God. First Thessalonians chapter four. Pay attention to what he says about how a Christian sh- should live. He says, uh, finally then, brethren, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, we urge you and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you have received uh, uh, from us how you what? Ought to walk as Christians and to please God. Well, how should I walk, Paul? Well, what's God's will? For uh, you to know what the commandments uh, we gave you uh, through the Lord Jesus are. He says, for this is the will of God. What is God's will? I mean, I've been asked this a million times. I mean, how do I know the will of God? I don't know what the will of God is. Have you read the Bible? What's the will of God? 
your what? Sanctification, your daily holiness. He says God's will is that you would be more holy uh, today than you were yesterday, God's will. So he, w- he says pursue sanctification, and how should I go about doing that? That you abstain from, he says let me mention one, sexual immorality or uh, pornea. Any, if you study the lexical meaning of the word, it's any kind of uh, sexual relationship outside the bonds of holy matrimony is sexual immorality. He says uh, abstain from that, flee from that, run from that. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel uh, in sanctification with honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that here's the second thing a Christian should work on in their life. That no Christian should take advantage or defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is what? He's the avenger of all such. Translated, if you choose to pursue sexual sin as a Christian, if you pursue to pursue to defraud another Christian brother, God will not sit by statically. He will dynamically say, because he's holy, I as a father have to discipline that. And if you don't believe he does that, just read Hebrews 12. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He gets your attention, just like a good father would, to get a a child back on the right track. Uh, I had a a, a friend of mine, a pastor at a large church in uh, California, and he had an elder on his board who was a roofer. And so somebody in the church went to the roofer uh, to have that man do do their roof, because they figured he's an elder at the church, it's a mega church, and he'll, he'll do us good. So they paid, you know, half the fee. The guy sent the crew, ripped off the roof, started putting the shingles on, and then never came back. So if you're the prisoner, what are you going to do? Change churches? So he, he, he calls the guy in question and says, hey, were you guys coming back? No, we're not coming back. He, he never came back. He just took the money. He didn't finish the job. So the, the prisoner then went to the pastor and said, uh, could you talk to your elder? <laughs> He's a spiritual leader. This is, he's defrauding me. See, God's telling you, if you defraud another brother and you do it willfully and you don't repent of that, it's gonna kill your joy and God will be the avenger, meaning he'll do something to rattle your cage to get you to repent. And and David is speaking from experience. So God will bring discipline. So notice in verse six, he says, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. So if God's tapping you on the shoulder, hey, that's sin. You need to repent of that. Then repent. He says, if you do, surely in a flood of great waters, they'll not come near you. The flood of great waters, this is not from the devil, this is from God. Uh, Grammatically, this is called a metonymy of the cause for the effect. The cause is the flood, the effect is the discipline of God. What is he saying? If you lead a confessional life insensitive toward your sin before God's holy throne, asking God to forgive you, the flood of his discipline will not come near you. What's the implication? If I don't live a confessional life, his discipline will come to me and it will be like a flood. And then when you're sitting there wondering what happened, God's speaking through the adversity to say, you need to repent. So joy comes from that sensitivity. So God, uh, God's being real here. Verses seven to 10, notice what he says. He says, if you lead a confessional life, what does he, what does he give you? He says, uh, you, well, you get God as a hiding place. He says, you are my hiding place. In the Hebrew, it says it's a secret place. Uh, He says, you shall reserve me from trouble and you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. He says, if you lead a confessional life, God will become your hiding place. Hiding place from who? God. Remember who's he talking to in the passage? Christians, believers, who are getting out of sync with their walk with God. And he says, if you get in sync through confession, God will forgive you. If you don't, he'll discipline you because he loves you and call you back. Uh, and, and if you do have a confessional life, God will be like a secret hiding place that he will not bring his discipline to you because, uh, because you're living a holy life. He says, you shall preserve me from trouble. The Hebrew word for trouble here means to be in a tight place. Are you claustrophobic? How many would say, I am totally claustrophobic? I know my wife is. I, it's hard to see. Really? Claustrophobic, yeah. That's why you like this giant sanctuary, right? Yeah, um, uh, a couple months ago, uh, I had to have an MRI done, and I've had them done years ago when I was younger, and so I had to have an MRI done on my head because of pain I was experiencing, so, so, so I, they couldn't find the source, so they went in there to see what it was. So I went in, and I knew the drill, so I went, in, and went into the tube and everything, and they, they put that uh, face shield thing on you with headphones and told me what kind of music do you want to listen to and all that kind of stuff, and so they, they were sending me in there, and they gave me a, a, a button I could push if I wanted to escape. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm tough, you know, I'm not going to push that button. <laughs> yeah, they slid me in there. I asked the guy, hey, how long am I going to be in here? He goes, uh, about an hour. I'm like, oh, great. So he sent me in there. 
I'd say within about three minutes, I was pushing the button like a psycho person. Uh, 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 get me out of here. And so he, I'm confessing. So he pulls me out of there. And he just got in the sound booth, the thing that they sit in. He comes running in there. What's the problem? Man, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I, that thing over my face, the headphones, I can't see. The little mirrors looking back down. I mean, I'm in this tube. I mean, I'm down in the tube. I mean, way in it. I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. Uh, he goes, well, just sit up. Have a Zen moment or something. I'm like, well, no, I need to pray about it. I need to talk to God. But so I just, I said, okay, let me focus for just a little minute. And uh, I think I can do it. So he sent me back in there. I was in there for like an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah. I wanted out of there. It was a tight place, place because that, that's what trouble is, isn't it? Trouble's like a tight place. I mean, I, get me out of here. What's, I gotta, give me a escape button. But I, was, I, was, I felt too bad like if I started pushing the button again. So I was just like, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to endure this thing. I'm just going to focus. He says, if you, if you lead a confessional life, God will uh, preserve you from tight places brought about by God trying to get your attention through the tight place. That's what they're from. Notice what he says in uh, verse 10. It says, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. God will surround him if he lives a confessional life. God's going to be your source of help in a time of trouble. He says, if you lead that confessional life, God's going to bless your life and give you joy. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? Remember that story? At the beginning of the church age? And they come to the, uh, the disciples and they tell the disciples, we sold some property and we're going to donate all the proceeds to the church. And then they didn't. They lied and they kept back part of the money because they agreed. What happened to them? Well, they died in succession. God removed them at the beginning of the, the church age because they did not repent of their lying. They, it says in Acts 5, they didn't just lie to the disciples. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Go read Acts 5. And so God took them out because he said, I'm going to have to discipline you because of the nature of your sin. Lying and deception can be a sin will eat through the church. I can't have that. So I need to make an example out of your sin. They should have hid themselves in God instead of hiding themselves in their love of money. And David says, God wants to give you great joy, but you must lead a confessional life. In, in uh, Ephesians chapter five, uh, notice what Paul says about how you should live your life of holiness. Here's what he says. Verse 18, he says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Uh, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, seeking and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Don't be controlled by wine, but be controlled by the Spirit. When you become a Christian, you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he comes and t takes uh, uh, control of you. He comes to reside with you. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says he baptizes you into Jesus. Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says he's like your engagement ring that one day you'll see Christ face to face. In Ephesians 4, uh, 30, after he lists, lists a whole bunch of sins that, that Christians commit in verses 25 to 29, he says when you sin like this, you grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you're, you're sealed till the day of redemption. That's why I believe in eternal security. He's not going anywhere, but you grieve him. So if you challenge the holiness of God, uh, he's not static, he's dynamic. But he says, if you do lead a life where you seek his daily filling, God control me, control my mind, control my mouth, control me, fill me. That's, that's different than indwelling. Indwelling is point in time. Well, filling is a daily thing where you yield to the spirit. What does it say that he gives you? It says that he gives you hymns and spiritual songs and singing in your heart. Meaning when you live a confessional life, God will give you a song. A song to go, man, that is, that, that's between me and God. A special song. I don't even know how many times God's given me songs in my Christian walk. That's just between me and him. And when you get that song, you know it's from God because it's like an anointed song. And sometimes it's emotional when you get the song. And you may not even be ready for it and God gives it to you. I want to share with you a song God gave me one day, not, not long ago. Um, it's just too good. I'm just going to play a little minute clip of it. But this is the kind of song God would give you after confession to say, yeah, I'm there for you. Here's a, here's a clip. You say, Lord, I want to live a confessional life. What's he say? I'm going to forgive you. And when you're not expecting it, I'm going to give you a song. And that song is going to tell you about me. I mean, when I first got that song, Pastor Michael sent it to me and said, have you ever heard this? You need to watch this. And I was sitting at my desk when he sent it to me. I mean, I, I just started tearing up and crying when I heard it. Because there's nothing better than Jesus, right? Because what's he do? He takes a sinner, he puts you back together, and he blesses you with joy. And that's what David is talking about. That, that kind of protective joy. Number two, 
A joyful living focuses on the promise, verses 8 and 9. God gives you a promise. What's his promise to you? Puts it in the first person. What does God promise you? He says, I will instruct who? You. I will teach you in the way that you should go. So if you want to know the way of God, just read Proverbs. Choose this way, not that way. Uh, choose the wise way, not the foolish way. He says, I will instruct and I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Um, I mean, think about God guiding you with his eye. Not that he really has an eye like we do. That's an anthropomorphic term applied to God. Uh, but think about God guiding you. Think about our, our greatest satellites and what they can, pictures they can take. One of my friends uh, who was a pilot uh, many years ago for the Air Force flew Blackbird spy planes. And after he retired and was a colonel, uh, he, he told me just how good of pictures he could take uh, when he was assigned to a given area uh, where he flew. Uh, think about what they can see from space, but just think of what God can see, who, who knows your life from the beginning to the end. He says, I will guide you as your confessional, I will guide you. But he says, in the meantime, I promise to teach you. Live this way, it's as holy, this way is godless. Live this way. The problem is um, we have a free will. Uh, and David knows that, uh, and he says, I'm going to um, be honest here. He said, There's a, 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 we have the option to choose to follow or choose not to follow on any given day. So what does he say? Well, he says, let me give you some advice of uh, this God who's promised to teach you the way. By the way, coming to church is dangerous in what way? <laughs> do you understand this? I just told you what God said you should do. You should live a confessional life that leads to joy, and now you know what you need to do. And so he says, uh, let me give you some advice from my past. Don't be like these two animals. And so here's, here's, here's what he says. He says, don't be like a horse or like a mule, which uh, have no understanding, which must uh, be harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. I don't know about you, I am not the horse whisperer. I mean, if you put me in a corral with horses, they are not gonna come to me. Uh, have you ever ridden a mule? This is the quietest church of all time. And as the lights are low, I'm just kind of sitting back and gelling and taking, are you hearing me? He's saying, don't be like a horse and don't be like a mule. When I, uh, when I was 27 and Liz was 25, uh, between my master's degree in Hebrew and my working on, starting to work on PhD in Hebrew, I needed a break academically, just kind of rest. So we went to a dude ranch. Uh, <laughs> Liz is shaking her head. Um, we went to a dude ranch, and we're from San Diego. We don't know about horses. So we go to the dude ranch outside of Houston for a week. And on day one, we paid for a personal guide to take us on a horseback ride. And so we went out into the middle of the boonies in a pine forest and jumped on these two horses, and the guy looked at me and he said, you want this thing to run? <laughs> I'm like, this thing better not even trot slowly. I mean, just walk me through the forest. And so he went on this big old long ride on these two horses, us two San Diegans, uh, and we got back. For the rest of our vacation, neither one of us could walk. <laughs> I, kid you, I kid you not, it's the worst trip, right, that we ever had, because we're not used to riding horses. Because if the horse didn't have that little bridle on there, he'd be doing his own thing, right? I mean, I, I actually rode like a, I don't know if it was a donkey or a mule, but uh, it, was a, it was one of them. Uh, when I was in Israel, the first time right after 9-11, and I took a tour group over there with people, uh, and we all got donkeys on the, on the Arbel Cliffs in the Golan Heights, thousands of foot drop down to the Sea of Galilee. And the, and the Jewish people there, that we, ju we jumped on these burlap bags over the backs of these donkeys, and they said, you know, uh, there are two words you need to know. You know, and they gave, this word means go, this means stop. Okay, what was that word? Okay, what's that? And so they told us the word, and the words kind of sounded similar. And I know Hebrew, but I don't know modern Hebrew. So, so we took off, our whole tour group's going to the side of this mountain, and my friend and I, Rick Seeley, the, who is the head of homicide, my best friend, we're, we're at the front of the pack trying to get our donkeys up this hill, but there, it's hard to ride a donkey straight line. And we look back down the mountain, and all of our tour group is all over the mountainside. Come on, come on. And we get to the, near the cliff, and I ask my friend Rick, what, because my donkey's still going. And I'm like, what's, what's the word for stop? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what, what's the word for go? I, I don't remember. So we both just jumped off our donkeys and tied them to trees. <laughs> See? Okay, because like, what do donkeys do? They don't do what you want them to do. What are we like as people? Hmm? Okay. I know there's probably no one here like this, but uh, stubborn people. Remember, like stubborn people? Like stubborn as a what? Like a mule. 
Yeah, you know, when God tells you, you need to confess that, and you're like, not today, I'm not. No way, I've been doing that sin forever. I'm not confessing that. God's like, you need to confess that. It's robbing you of your joy. I'm, mm, y'all, I'm digging my hoofs in. I'm sitting down, I'm not moving. Is that you? Are you, are you like, a, like one of those horses just running all over the place? God says, that, don't be like that, because if you live like that in your Christian walk, it robs you of your joy. What, what's the solution? Live a, live a confessional life. I say, God, sorry for me being stubborn and doing this kind of sin. I've, I've defamed you. I repent of that. When you repent of that, God forgives you. Uh, and then you get the wonder of uh, the last point here, which I close with. What do you get? Uh, what does he challenge you to do if God's forgiven you? And you said, I don't want to be the donkey anymore. I don't, I don't want to be that mule going against you, God. I don't want to act like a horse with no bridle. What, what, do you, what does he say you should do? Uh, be joyful and praise God. Uh, this is how he started. This is how he's ending on, on praising God. And in rhetorical terms, this is called inclusio. Inclusio is a rhetorical device in Hebrew uh, where you, 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 how you begin is, and is how you end. It's like a beautiful bow tied around a package. And he says, what the most important thing about having a joyful life is praising God who forgave you. Notice the, the three commands in Hebrew here. First one is what? It's in English. Be glad. Be glad. Be glad in who? In the Lord. Not in you. Be glad in the Lord. Secondly, second command, rejoice. Third command, shout. Shout. So I would say that the first one, be glad, is for the introverted Christian. <laughs> I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be glad. I am totally, I'm dripping with gladness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just glad. I'm just glad. Okay, that's, that's the introverted Christian. That'd probably be me. Uh, the other two are for the Pentecostal charismatic types. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. Because uh, we're there what? Rejoice. And what's the last one? Shout for joy. Yeah, shout for joy. So, so you have the first guy over here, the introvert, right? And then you have the other one that's over here. He's more, you know, he's more, he's flowing with the spirit. So when God forgives him, he's like, man, I am glad. But he's like, woo! Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, he, you cannot believe what I brought before God, a sin I've struggled with forever. I've been the mule totally on that one. He, I confess that he forgave me. Hallelujah! Can you imagine if I preached like this? Yeah. I mean, passion. When is the last time you got that excited over God forgiving you? Well, you know, I confess this thing and he totally wiped it clean. Praise God, amen. Or you cannot believe what he forgave me for. What he forgave my husband for, what he forgave my wife for, what he my child for, what, what I did to my parents. I pastored my parents for 19 years in California. Constantly after services, they came to me and they said, you did that? <laughs> And my dad's a federal agent. I'm like, uh, yeah, I did that. I just never told you what I did. Um, it's just like when you get forgiveness from your parent, it's like coming clean. It's exciting, isn't it? But we're also stilted educated, are we not? After today, we should have a total Pentecostal church, right? I'm just saying. So what does God want from you to do, to, for you to do in your life? Uh, to give him praise when he forgives you. To be excited about it. To be excited about it. And how do you get to a point where you want to praise God? You confess and when you confess, he forgives, he restores, and then he puts wind in your cells called joy. Uh, and then you head back out in life uh, to take on the next round of uh, sin that you want to get victory over. You should know exactly what you should do when you leave this house of worship. You say, God, I'm the mule, and I need to confess. And God's going to say, well, it's about time, and I've been waiting for you, and I'm ready to forgive. Let's pray. God, thank you for the scriptures. David uh, was a real man. Uh, he had many, many uh, sinful um, chinks in his armor, and we all can click them off, but uh, we're no different, and uh, we pray that those things that we have done or that we are doing, that you might convict us, we might listen, we might turn to you, we might confess, not, and, and realizing that you're not only going to forgive us, you're going to restore us, and you're going to give us a joy because things are right with you now. And we pray that you would uh, move people here today to, to develop that kind of inner confessional life, realizing the value of it. And for that person that doesn't know you, that's either watching online or in our body today, that doesn't know you, doesn't know the joy of walking with the God who came and lived and died and rose for them, might this be the day they turn their life to you in Christ's name. Amen.